Bronze and Modern Gods. Uh, hi, Richard. Hey, John. How you doing? Good. Welcome back. We're glad to have you back. Did you have a Thank nice you. break? Yes, it was nice. It was nice and relaxing. Uh, I like your T-shirt. <laughs> I'm wearing this for Kmart. Kmart gave me this shirt um, last year uh, at uh, North Coast. And uh, shout out to him. I don't I, care. That's only so you can say something about my shirt. <laughs> it's <laughs> very stylish. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, hey, uh, welcome to the show. Uh, we're off to a great start, aren't we? Um, underrated books of the week, viewer mail, where we take your questions and comments. We've got a trip back to 1999 with the 25 year old this week. Let's get things started, as all we always do. Uh, hot with the week, Richard. Two weeks in a row. You weren't here for last week's Doctor Doom book, so you take this one. Yeah, it's Super Villain Team number 14. Uh, from 1977, and it features Doom Supreme. <laughs> uh, you got you got uh, Doom on the cover, and uh, looks like the Avengers all around him bowing. Magneto has dared to challenge me, bow slaves, and show him Earth's true master. <laughs> I love it. It's you know, it's a super villain team of Doctor Doom and Magneto, and Magneto's not even on the cover. I mean, he's in the corner box, and he gets mentioned twice. <laughs> it doesn't awesome. even make the cover it's totally doom if, if doom was to do the book this is exactly how you would want it laid out for the cover what do you uh, think of this uh classic john Byrne cover uh i like it you know it's 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 period you know the, they they've done a lot of these kind of uh covers and i like it i like the you know all the characters represented on it i like the the general layout and of course it focuses on doom as he would want it to be have um, you ever read the story no i haven't Okay, first of all, special place in my heart because it starts here and it continues in Champions number 17. Ah, okay. Yeah, or 16, I think, yeah, the last issue or second to last issue of the Champions. So, you know, I'm, I'm all on board. Uh, here's what annoys me about this story. Um, Dr. Doom has released, oh, spoilers. Okay, so skip ahead if you haven't read this. Um, you haven't read it from 1977. 50 years. <laughs> um, he re has released something in the atmosphere, a gas that makes everybody on Earth his slaves. And he just decides, you know, one day, oh, I'm going to activate it. And then, you know, he he takes over the Earth. That's it. And then Magneto is one of the few people, along with the Beast, I think, are two people that are not affected by the gas and they have to figure out a way to uh, make everything back to normal, which they do. All right, fine. Going forward, what's to stop Doom from doing the same thing again? Yeah, it sounds like it sounds like a great plan. Yeah. I mean, his arrogance, of course, you know, is his fault this time. But what's stopping him from doing it again and just not being arrogant the second time? Right, right. Um, high grade raws of this book are selling on eBay now for around twenty five to thirty bucks. It's all about the cover. Um, but speaking of that cover, Richard, there's not only a Whitman variant. There's also a 35 cent variant of this book. So collect them all, kids. Uh, 9.8 last sold in 2018 for $129. And doing a quick lookup, there's only 10 9.8s on the census. Oh, wow. Is that, oh, wow, rare or, oh, wow, nobody's cared enough? Uh, I, I think it's, oh, well, no one's cared enough. I'm, I'm sure if this book got super hot, we would, we would see a quadrupling of number 9.8s within a week. Yeah. Uh, is this just a book that people just haven't, I don't think, felt the need to grade? I think we're going to see that quadrupling coming up because a 9.4 sold just last month being May uh, for $134 for a 9.4. So yeah, I think it's the doom effect. I think there's a lot of there's a lot of buzz behind him as the big baddie uh, in the MCU and people are uh, finally turning their interest to him. Speaking of CGC slabs, a uh, follow up for everybody that is not a member. We talked about this on the members only live stream last week, uh, but we had a viewer mail from a, 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 a member who had submitted his Ghostbusters UK number one that had a prize attached with tape to the front, a badge, and he gets a 9.0 and notes and the graders notes saying, tape stain on cover so 
you know, he and I start some trouble on the CGC forums and say, hey, wait a second, why are we both getting dinged? Why are UK people uh, submitting, getting dinged for production defects, which is what this is. Uh -huh. And so there's a link to the in the description to the uh, discussion in the forum where CGC Mike, poor CGC Mike, comes on board and says, yeah, these things are graded on a curve. And he kind of gives a vague answer, not to fault him. I think he's just repeating what he's been told. And uh, some other people jump in and say, wait a second, you guys have to clarify this. And paraphrasing big time here, paraphrasing big time, CGC <laughs> comes back and says, basically, look, we're too busy to be dealing with this right now. We'll come back to it later. Um, I don't like that grading on the curve comment. That that just doesn't see, sit well with me. Well, let's let everybody judge for themselves. Link in the description to the forum post and the discussion. I just wanted to make sure I followed up on that this week because uh -huh. I promised that I would. Uh, no answers yet. Are tape stains on UK books considered a defect or not? The jury is still out. Yeah. Well, let's not show. Do you have any UK books to show and show and tell this week? No, I don't. Okay, then let's just <laughs> switch to the screen. Wah! You start. You you were in here last week, so you go oh. first. Okay. Uh, mine's went to a show today. Uh, Harper is a gentleman who puts on a number of shows to the, the course of the year here in northeastern Ohio, and uh, he had a show here this past week, uh, this weekend. Uh, I went with our friend Forrest. And um, one of the vendors, one new vendor there, which is which is great to see, seeing new vendors at a comic book show, uh, it's, as opposed to just the same old vendors you normally see. Uh, he had a bin of books that were um, $20, or if you paid cash, they were $10. Mm. So I pulled a bunch of books, and these are all $10, which I paid for these books, as you'll see in the next. Individually, 10 bucks a week. Yeah. Okay. First one is Mage number one. Uh, for those who have not read this series, go out, stop, stop watching the podcast and go buy the trade paperback for this series. It is a amazing Arthurian um, story told from a, a different angle. And uh, it's really cool. I really, when, I, when, I, when this came out originally, I, I was just um, enthralled with the story. Um, and uh, Matt Wagner, the, the the writer and artist for it, is an amazing st storyteller. And it's just one of the gems of the 80s, in my opinion. Great. Uh, this one's probably a 9-2. Nice. There's a little rub on the spine. Mm -hmm. Needs a press. But uh, no, it's high grade. It's, it's just not a 9A candidate. Wow. Did, okay, I don't want to spoil it because you probably have more from that stack coming, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, went shopping today myself when uh had to go run some errands had to go into the valley deep deep into the uh san fernando valley here in southern california stopped at my uh other favorite haunt house of secrets in burbank and they got a new collection of uh some 80s indies so i grabbed a few oh okay including the maze agency number 11 any idea who did that cover? No idea. Take a close look. It's uh, Al, not Alan Davis. That's Adam Hughes. Is it really? Yeah, Adam Hughes was the uh, regular artist on uh, Maze Agency. You know, it was one of his first assignments. Um, he did not draw the interiors of this issue. Uh, Rob Phipps uh, and Alan Davis did this. And now that I'm looking at this cover, I don't even think this is a. <laughs> I don't even think this is an Adam Hughes cover. I think this is an. Oh, Alan no. It's an Alan Davis cover. I mean, now that I'm looking at these figures, mm -hmm. uh, I'll have to go uh, look. And um, But I'm pretty sure this is not Adam Hughes. This is Alan Davis. But Adam Hughes, obviously, um, I think Mage's, May's Agency 14 has a classic Adam Hughes cover. Uh, but he did start on the Maze Agency. So I saw these and I picked a few up. I thought that was pretty cool. What's your next one? Let's see. What do I want to pick? Um, we'll pick. We did... We did uh, Mage, another book from that era, is Grendel. Oh. <laughs> that was a $10 one too? $10 one, yeah. Not a uh, year ago, right? No, exactly. Uh, you know, the, the Grendel story is another um, really interesting Matt Wagner. 
it's hard to call it a story. It's it's more of a series of stories around people who take up the mantle of Grendel. So it's Grendel isn't one person particularly. Um, across the different stories he tells, they end up being different people. But uh, it's, it's a it's another good story. If you haven't read it, uh, it's a great indie story to pick up. This is the uh, Kamiko. Was the other one was Kamiko too? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, if you if you uh, like a nice original indie stories, it's a good book. Uh, Grendel was actually the backup feature in Mage. Mm -hmm. um, am I looking at that right? Is that a newsstand? Yes, it is. Holy moly! Uh, there you go. That makes it worth ten bucks. Yeah. Uh, you know, obviously the reference to not last year was uh, there was a. Uh, movie announced or a Netflix show announced and then it was pulled. Uh, right. So that's why it's kind of dropped back down. I, uh, you know, to me, it's just this, you know, it's the story. It's um, love that, that era of uh, 80s independence. Oh, we're on the same wavelength today because I have Roach Mill number six. <laughs> I have not heard of Roach Mill in long time. That is Look at that price. Yeah. Plus my discount. For being a pull list customer there. That's uh, awesome. Roachmill number six. And I had a little twofer. How about the Dark Horse Roach Mill number one? Oh, nice. When it went to Dark Horse. Mm -hmm. So filling up that Roach Mill collection with the, just a few <laughs> stragglers I'm missing. Uh, 80s Indies, what do you got? All right. Let's, let's, uh, let's pick another 80s Indies. This is Critters number two. Wow. We always hear about one. Yeah. Uh, Critters number one is, uh, is uh, I consider it a key. It's a good, it's just, it's uh, the start of this series. Um, this is um, these fanographics. It's the whole, um, it's the whole, uh, oh my gosh, when I, the, the funny animals kind of character where you've got anthropomorphic animals. Like you see the fox there and uh, they tell the birthright storyline is something that runs through this book. And then it also it's its own, uh, its own book about a, monarchy escaping from uh, a civil war it's, it's an interesting story uh but this it's it's, it's, it's uh i forget how many issues this ran but in, if you like funny animals it's a great series of uh short stories and ongoing storylines through the whole series and um yeah it's another book that when that when it was out originally in the 80s i bought every month i bought a lot of books because they're they were interesting and different and you doing, doing things they hadn't done before. I feel jaded nowadays uh, <laughs> picking up books because oh, I've read that before, or I've seen this before. Uh, but now this, this, this was a pretty uh, interesting uh, book. A matter of fact, pretty much anything from Fanographics back in the day, I, I seem to have liked. They did, a, did some really, really innovative comics. If issue one has Usagi in it, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, issue one, is, is Usagi in issue one? That's a good question. I, I don't remember. Uh, Albedo is the series that was also from uh, this that that um, spawn. Albedo number two was the first um, uh, Usagi story. Right. But I thought he might have been in Critters 1. Uh, he so probably is. If the, I have number one around here someplace. He's on the cover, I think. I don't so know if he's actually in the story. Someone will tell us. Um, not quite an 80s indie, uh, but a Marvel Silver Age book that I got today. Thor 128 with Hercules. The yeah, I was, I was like, boy, why did you buy that? <laughs> Look at the grade on this bad boy. It looks nice. I mean, that's the that's from the residue from the sticker that I just peeled uh -huh. off. Um, but it is super sharp, at least an I know, maybe higher once I uh, press it. I like the uh, grease pencil arrival date. Mm -hmm. I'm going to leave that, but uh, with my discount, could not resist this. I have a copy, but not this sharp, so I'll sell the undercopy in a live sale coming up. Uh, almost had a complete um, 80s indie show and tell between the two. Uh, yeah. And I had to ruin it with that last one. <laughs> but we've done three each, so I think it's time for us to remind everyone to support the show. Become a member right here for the cost of $2.99 a month. 
that's about how much critters cost back in the day when you were buying it off the newsstand. Uh, you get exclusive live member only streams on Thursday slash Thor's day. You get an extra members only episode on Wednesdays, shout outs in future videos, just like this, where you see your name. Oh my gosh, there I am. Look at me. Uh, <laughs> and we will be doing uh, San Diego comic con this year. I just bought my plane tickets for NEO comic con in Northeast Ohio. Do you know, on American, Richard, I, we got round trip plane tickets to Cleveland, LAX, and back. Two hundred and sixty seven dollars. Wow. And I just bought. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I'm just saying it's insanely low. I bought tickets to go to San Diego for, uh, you know, the week prior that would have been three hundred and sixty dollars round trip. But I'm an old man and I decided I wanted extra leg room. So that bumped up the price by another three hundred dollars. Come on, Splurger. Yeah, well, you know, I the thing is sitting in an airplane for five plus hours with your knees, you know, behind your ears is not a pleasant experience. <laughs> you haven't lived. No, uh, I guess not. <laughs> let's check out <laughs> viewer mail. You've our got mail. Viewer mail comes to our to us via our email at bronzeandmoderngods at gmail.com from our good buddy, John Shrewsbury, a.k.a. Shrews Clues. Hi, folks. Just a few things about the latest show. It's so good to see Union Jack get some love again in Union Jack the Ripper. Yes, the book had flaws, but it was the best of the Blood Hunt books I've read. Mm. I still go back to the Captain America 253, 254 issues with Union Jack and Baron Blood once a year because of how solid that story and art were. Regarding selling a collection, I recently did just this. We live in a small bungalow style house in the city and space is at a premium. After years of looking at a dozen plus long boxes, not even really knowing what I had, I decided to sell 98% of it, keeping only my Marvel Conan run and Savage Sword. It has been a complete relief. Now I feel like uh, a new collector hungry for the hunt and actually reading my books again. Lastly, it was good to see Evan in a leading role for an episode. Nice. Thank you for the great show, Shrews. Um, getting rid of a collection is uh, somewhat liberating in a lot of respects. Um, when I sold off my collection twice, uh, I didn't have that feeling of relief that you're having. I'm glad you're feeling that. When I sold off my CDs, mm -hmm. I had like 3,000 CDs. I transferred them all to a giant um, Wi-Fi enabled hard drive in FLAC quality. Uh, so they're still CD quality files and I can stream them throughout the house anytime I want. I have not missed one CD that I sold, Richard. I, I know, I know. That is definitely liberating, especially the route that you took, which is the FLAC files so you don't get compression. That's awesome. And I, I sold them all I to Amoeba, and I sold a few really rare ones on eBay. I had Reflex, The Politics of Dancing on CD, which I guess is super scarce. I sold that for $290 on eBay, just one uh, CD. I remember going to your apartment. I, uh, side story. Uh, it was my birthday. We were, we were having a, a birthday celebration at the club that we frequented. Uh, the fantasy nightclub for those who remember 90, early early uh, 90s. Anyway, um, I wanted to have special music played. So we went to John's house and he has all of his CDs <laughs> along the entire wall in the closet. It was this massive, massive collection. Alphabetized. And, alphabetized, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and we went through that collection and we picked a good 70, 80 songs um, for, for that night. Just... And the only, this is before streaming, before it's anything like that. So this is the only way I felt really privileged to have, have access to a collection that that massive that we literally literally name any song and John would be able to pull the CD out for it. It was awesome. Oh, certain genres. I didn't yeah. just lacking in jazz and funk. Uh, but comics, could you could you get rid of everything at this point now? Yes, I definitely could. I mean, just just like uh, just like Shrews Clues, I, I could see having a core. Mm -hmm. uh, 50 books, let's say, and everything else is transitory. I'd sell it, bring new things in, get rid of things. But that core set of 50 books are, you, you know, my, 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 the heart of my collection. And, um, I think that would be, that would be liberating because 
you wouldn't feel like now if I, I just bought 10 books and, and I didn't buy more because I'm thinking, where am I going to put them? Do I have to buy another short box to be able to put these things? And I'll never, you know, I'll look at them maybe once in a while, but other than that, they're just adding to that millstone around your neck. One in, one out. I'm telling you, yeah. it, it's been a lifesaver for me. Uh, it makes the live sales fun too. Uh, what about you? Could you go down to, to almost nothing? I, I could if I didn't have the heartbreak of psoriasis. If I did not have the heartbreak of the Venuses. Uh, Okay. You know, still haunting me and all those golden age books that I had and all that pre-code uh, monster books that I had. And I don't know, um, I when I did the last purge in 2010, I forgot a box. And that is the box with all of my Kirby Marvel Westerns, like uh -huh. all my, my Gunsmoke Westerns, my mm -hmm. Kid Cold Outlaws, my Rawhide Kids, my Two Gun Kids. And after you know i moved and i was settled i found that box again and i was so happy that that box was there you know um could it have been the venuses i wish no um but i completely had forgotten about that box and just just as recently when you and i were talking offline there was the time when i was doing the organization like two months ago and i found an entire box of slabs yeah I forgot about. So there's always that thrill of finding things like, oh. And then I've I I've won, you know, in in the weirdest sense of the word. I had a victory when there have been books of just books I've been buying new off the stands, you know, in the early 2000s and 2010s mm -hmm. that I just saved. And like you go through them now, like there's an ultimate Fallout 4. There, you know, just stuff that I had buying it off the stands, kind of like Evan's collection now that he's going mm -hmm. through. Well, I, I think of Evan, you know, in particular, he's got 50 some odd long boxes mm -hmm. um, that he has moved, like, again, like a millstone around his neck from house mm -hmm. to house. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think he bought his new house <laughs> just because it had enough room for all those <laughs> long boxes. Mm -hmm. But, you know, do you want to pass that, you know, when, if you, once you, you're gone, somebody else has got to deal with that. And, and, you know, do you want that burden on your family trying to deal with your collection? That's my revenge. Uh, what is your first piece of your mail? Uh, my first piece is from one of my favorite names, my minifig empire, uh, here on YouTube. Uh, and he said, uh, Evan did an amazing job co-hosting. Great job. Thanks bronze and modern gods for all the amazing common content. I always love watching your videos every week. Thank you. My Aww. minifigs appreciate it. And yes, Evan did an awesome job. I want to thank him again for sitting in and um, being being uh, John's uh, foil <laughs> for the for the show. I watched it; it was a great show. So uh, we always tap Evan for his his huge comic book knowledge. Yeah, but we missed you. Um, speaking of Evan and what he covered last week, he did a lot of DC discussions mm -hmm. on DC Comics which is a blind spot for us admittedly sometimes. So we're happy to have him up for that. And it leads into my next piece of viewer mail from our buddy, Robert Pearson. I also collected Firestorm like Evan, and that got me looking more into DC after that. Still didn't collect too many, but Teen Titans and Firestorm were in my pull list at that mm -hmm. time. Robert, me too. Um, Firestorm was a bit of a gateway for me. Uh, Teen Titans, I liked the... DC Comics presents number 26 insert. And I think I bought the first issue off the stands. And then issue two, I saw the cover with Deathstroke. Of, eh, this isn't for me. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know, we can't all win a thousand percent of the times. But yeah. I did I did read Firestorm um, pretty regularly until about issue 15 or so. But I came back into DC big time with their renaissance around 1985, 1986. Mm -hmm. Watchmen, Dark Knight Returns, Longbow Hunters. I mean, man, uh, Suicide Squad revival. So many books. I, I was a DC guy after that and Marvel guy. I was buying mm -hmm. way too much. Uh, what George, Perez, George Perez uh, and Marvel Wolfman's Teen Titans pulled me in. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I wasn't a big firestorm. Uh, I, I also had it on my pull list. It was one of those books that just got added to my collection um, by default. Um, I, I just a few few years ago, I came across though a stack of firestorm number ones 
uh, all mint, mint, mint condition uh, for a buck a piece. And so I bought them. So I have a, 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 a good quantity of Firestorm number ones, just hoping for the day that something happens in the DCU. 77 or 82? Uh, the, the one that Evan featured last year. 82, year. okay. Yeah. yeah. You say 77, you're sitting on a little. Uh, oh, yeah. No, it wasn't that good of a, of a score. But for a buck a piece, I, I couldn't pass them up. Right. Uh, what is your next piece of viewer mail? My next piece of viewer mail is from Planet Lang here on YouTube. Uh, and he said, I sent hundreds of books to see in for CGC grading and have never gotten above a 9.8. Just got back a 50 book modern submission and got six 9.9s. What? Strange things are afoot at the old CGC. Yeah, it's, you know, it's the, the whole grading process. This just feels like there's been this seismic shift in um, what, what, metrics they use to get those higher grade books and, and put them in either nine, eight, nine, nine, or even 10 categories. And, and, and I don't think those metrics are the same from five years ago. Yeah. Is that just the process? If you hold off grading a book for five years, it would, instead of getting a nine, eight for it, you'll get a nine, nine for it because the, the, the thing, the way that they're doing these gradings have changed. Uh, it's it makes me uncomfortable to to know that there is so much of um uncertainty on how they grade books over time there are many many other podcasts that go much deeper into this uh than we care to at this point frankly um but you know just looking around i see this huge uptick in 9.9s being issued so uh <laughs> you know, where if you were like me and Richard and you, you gave up, maybe it's the time now to submit again. Yeah. You know, what what may have been a nine six a year ago be a nine eight now. And now that you can do nine nine pre screens with modern books, if I think there is a chance of it being worth something, just buy twenty five copies of it, do a nine nine pre screen and send them in, you'll only get charged for the ones that pass the pre-screen, you know, the rest of them you pay whatever it's $7 for, mm -hmm. uh, and end up with a stack of nine nines. And, you know, you couldn't do that five years ago. There was, it was impossible to do that process. Now it's, it's what I would do if I had, uh, the, the means and, and had some good ideas that a book is going to be worth something. Evan was talking about how he, uh, got new slabs from CGC and he needed to break the case. Uh, to repress his ultimate Black Panther number one to resubmit it. And that leads into my next piece of viewer mail from Spiders Comics. Agree, Evan. The new CGC cases are really difficult to open now. I tried my usual trick of slide the fingernail up until you find the gap, but no dice. They've actually started to seal the books into the case these <laughs> days. Can you imagine the CGC meeting where the new kid raises their hand and says, I have a suggestion, sir. Could we shut the case so people can't slip the book out? <laughs> to see the disbelief in the older guy's eyes would have been priceless. That's awesome. That would be my uh, pimple-faced teen from The Simpsons <laughs> invitation. Everybody keep a track. I haven't gotten a new case that I've had to crack yet. Uh, have you? I, I got a case when I, my, my uh, X-Men 120 got... Um, uh, reholdered so when it came back i looked at the case and it is definitely a tank there are you know there it used to be kind of um you could like like um uh, the spider says you could put your fingernail in the case and you can run it up along the case along a gap well you can't do that anymore the, the case definitely is at least to me feels more secure and and less um less people can tamper with it so i think that's 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 awesome if that continues, but we have to remember there's been how many years of cases that have not I had know. that kind of protection in the in the past. So, but it's it's, it's a step forward. I, I I applaud them for actually doing something to uh, mitigate this whole problem. My comic pressing one hundred and one video from a couple of years ago outdated now because I'm just doing the twist. Yeah, yeah. I'll we'll have to try one and see if the twist still works. What is your last piece of your mail for this week? My last piece is from Matthew Marlin. Uh, great show, guys. Thank you. You did mention uh, the inc inciting incident of the Doom books uh, book blowing up. We're talking about Doom 1, the one shot. 
um, to my knowledge, is people realize, realizing that Sanford Green was paying homage to the deceased rapper, rapper MF Doom. Uh, I'm pretty sure people like me were not aware of this at uh, FLC time. So it was under ordered with that steep cover price and in super high demand on the week of release. Not saying it, it's a good uh, it's a good hold long term necessarily, but there is more to this book than meets the eye. There's already prior solo Doom series from a few years back that would be a more solid pure Doom spec, as that was the uh, the first solo series. Uh, yeah, okay. Here's actually my daughter brought this to my attention, uh, talking about Doom because she knows I I'm. I, I love Doom, and she was talking about MF Doom, who is one of her favorite rappers. Uh, unfortunately, he has passed, mm -hmm. and um, she was aware of the 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 tie-in. Uh, what but basically what happens is in the lead in the book, um, uh, part of one of uh, MF Doom's songs, the the lyrics are um, are a part of the the opening of the the story, and uh, so that's kind of the tie-in that the um, homage that was paid. Uh, but you know, she, my, I consider my daughter a civilian. Uh, she she was aware of this book and its influences, and um, that definitely increases the number of people who are interested in it and increases the value because of that. So, yeah, kudos to him. I I I myself am unfamiliar with MF Doom, other than um, if you've ever seen any pictures of him, he's got a Doom like mask that he wears as a part of his persona. Um, and, uh, that's that immediately you can, you can recognize him because he looks like doom basically. And, uh, he does his rapping with that mask on. So the, the tie in was, was, uh, definitive and I think appreciative, uh, for the fans of, of, uh, the rapper. There you go. Uh, thank you everyone for writing in. We always love seeing your viewer mail. Uh, just remember if you have something for a future episode, just leave us a comment here on YouTube or drop us a line at bronze and modern gods at gmail.com. Uh, first doom solo series. Yeah, I, it's, 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 uh, the, it was the series from a couple years ago. I've shown a cup, uh, do number one from there before as part of, um, one of some of my show and tells. Yeah. It's a good story. It's, it's, a. Uh, it's not his first solo series. Yeah, I was going to say, may I challenge Matthew and you yeah. on the first solo series? Series, not story. Story is Marvel Super Heroes 20. Yeah. Or yeah. solo series is Astonishing Tales from mm -hmm. 1970. Uh, he, he was a solo, uh, I was going to say solo artist. He had, he ran that book from issue one through eight with his solo series. Uh, you could argue unsuccessfully that supervillain team up was another mm -hmm. doom series we'll call it his first self-titled solo series there you go i'll take that one i'll take that one uh yeah well, let's take it all the way back to 1999 for the 25-year rule keeping the segue snappy short <laughs> and to the point the 25-year rule is when we go back 25 years when nostalgia kicks in when you're a kid teen whatever and you go back and try to recollect your childhood that's the 25 year rule this time 1999 superman number 150 anniversary issue two versions of this this one with the holographic foil cover mm. ooh glowy wait wait a foil cover in the 90s wow Go figure. Just getting it right under the 90s, uh, under the wire there in 1999. Uh, I actually prefer the uh, regular cover by uh, Dan Jerkins and Kevin Nolan, where he's standing in front of a flag. It's actually a much more attractive cover. But hey, this is the one we're talking about. Um, another thing about this book is I had no idea Steve Epting, who I know from a runs on the Avengers and Captain America, he had a run on Superman in the late 90s. Huh. Oh, no. Uh, who knew this as well? This book, Richard, right here, holographic foil, 1999. Ross are actually selling on eBay for as much as $25 for a super high grade copy. Wow. Would wow. you not think this is a dollar bin book all day long? Absolutely. I, I, I would have, I would have a hard time paying more than a dollar for this book. <laughs> I thought, you know what? I'll 
I'll do the perfunctory thing that we always do and look up to see how much raws are selling. And I was waiting to say, you can grab a raw of this for three to five dollars. No, um, there were a couple of, you know, three to five dollar sales, but there were several eleven ninety nine, fifteen ninety eight, twenty five dollars. Wow. So either it was not very heavily ordered, this version, uh, the, the flag version as well sells for a premium. So, uh, I will say the flag one, I can see it's almost like a classic cover. This one, not so much, but shocker. It is a shocker. I'm I'm very surprised that a Superman book from the late 90s is, is pulling that kind of cheddar. You know, it's interesting DC. We're getting uh, a lot of DC love this week. We are talking about Superman here. We're talking about uh, Firestorm earlier. Now we move on to our underrated books of the week. And go figure. We don't plan these things, guys. Richard and I do these notes separately. We both picked DC Comics. You yeah. go ahead. I picked uh, Omega Man, uh, the Omega Man number three from 1983. It's the first appearance of our buddy Lobo. Look at um, the cover. <laughs> yeah, it's so, it's so, you know, personifies him. Um, Lobo is, I, I call him the Wolverine of, of the DCU. He is the bad boy. Uh, he has Superman level strength. He has teamed up with Superman uh, on a number of occasions. He has sparred you know, and, and, and fought Superman on a number of occasions. He is kind of that um, um, hard to pin down character, kind of like Doom and, and um, uh, Namor. He's he's a good bad guy or a bad good guy is how I look at him. Anti-hero. Anti-hero is a very absolutely very apropos. Uh and I I'm you know I'm looking at, you know, first of all, I'm just absolutely surprised that this book for a character who has been in a number of not only Superman stories, but DCU stories in general, uh, it's still you can still buy it for 50 bucks raw. Uh a, a 9.8 average sale for the past 12 months is 310 bucks. The last sale was 300 dollars to me for a nine eight of a book for a first appearance of a character who is this prominent is is just amazing and i i think you know if we're talking about movie properties and tv shows and what have you superman has a problem and that is his persona is hyper good and that makes the kinds of stories that you can talk about and have him involved in limiting because you can't have Superman killing somebody. You can't have Superman, you, you know, there, there's a limit to what he can do because of his, as, as, as uh, Batman says, his Boy Scout um, appearance. Lobo is a, a loose cannon. He is a wild card. And I think a movie with the two of them in it would be amazing because you would have that Boy Scout on the one side and you would have the, you know, the bad guy, the bad boy in the other side, and they could play off each other. And um, it would be a buddy movie, in my opinion, but it would be fun because you could, you know, it's, it's Superman doesn't normally have a, a compatriot that is at his power level. You know, you got Batman, but Batman's got to have all this augmentation to even be close to what Superman can do. Lobo is, doesn't, he doesn't have that problem. So you can have them, you know, spar as, as, uh, you know, equal level uh, opponents or be on the same side. So I, I think it's it's a great play. Will it ever happen? I don't know. Um, 3,000, uh, 9.8 on the census. So it's not <laughs> <laughs> it's not a scarce book. But I think if you come across this book in high grade, buy it because uh, I think there's a, there's a lot there's a lot to this book. Um, like I said, Lobo is one of those great characters that has a personality. Uh, and that's always good to see. And you never know what could happen with him. Heavily specced book back in the day, uh, not issue three, Omega Men in general, because uh, Keith Giffen was super hot. Legion was super hot at the time. Uh, this was one of the earliest direct sales only books for DC after Camelot 3000 and Ronin and a couple of others. So not scarce at all. I will say probably high grade, a little scarcer than we think because of all the 50 cent dollar bin uh, years these books spent. Do you think Devil's Advocate? Do you think the cover holds this book back? It could be better. I, I'm I'm torn in two ways. One, because the cover shows shows Lobo, you know, not giving an f about the universe and what they people think of him. He's got a woman strapped to the front of his 
uh, hover bike or, or space as bike. You, as you do. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, th I think it could, uh, it could be better. I'm wondering if the cover was done, you know, a lot of these things, the covers are done long before the story is actually written. Well, so I, I wonder if there's a disconnect there. And I don't, I don't mean quality of the cover. It's, you know, it's Keith Giffen. It's well drawn. It's well composed. I mean, the fact that Lobo doesn't look like Lobo. Lobo is wearing uh, orange and purple spandex. Yeah. Yeah, you know, he looks like your typical super villain. He actually looks like lunatic from the defenders, <laughs> which, you know, uh, Keith Giffen, I believe had a hand in help co-creating. So that's what I mean. If he looked like the Lobo, we know that this might be selling for a lot more. Yeah. If, if he looks like the, the, yeah, I, I agree. If, if it had that kind of look to it where, you know, he's bare chested and got bandoliers on his chest and, you know, he's got a, you know, the head in one hand or, and he has this signature um, chain. And I think that would definitely go, but you know, this is a character that's developed over time and um, gotten his own persona over time. So here at, originally when this cover is made, I don't, you know, that hadn't happened yet. I, I really wish they had picked a different uh, look for him, but you know, his face still, you know, that's Lobo's face, the white face when the, and the black uh, kiss makeup and the, Are you you're, you're saying that that's not Blood Wolf by Rob Liefeld? <laughs> okay, I, I I won't say that it's not a, that it's a unique look, but over time he definitely made it his. Did you ever read Legion eighty nine ninety ninety one ninety two? No, With Vril Dox uh, and uh, you know Brainiac 5's uh, predecessor, I believe, and Lobo was a team member of Legion eighty nine. I actually liked that book. It was weird that they try to shoehorn. Lobo into a team book, but it kind of worked. Lobo see. also had, had a daughter. Um, keep an eye um, on. Everybody's probably. had a daughter at this point. I know it's ridiculous. See, <laughs> um, my underrated book, also DC, also discussed on the live stream uh, last week. <laughs> our, our oh, wait, hold on. There we go. Our Army of War number 81 look at the condition of this book huh richard yeah you tried that on us under the All right. Right. <laughs> this is the 399 facsimile edition that quietly came out may 5th who knew um beautifully done uh, featuring the first appearance of sergeant rock now i'm putting air quotes around first appearance of sergeant rock we'll get to that in a second this facsimile richard we were talking about going back and printing books on newsstand paper right. uh -huh. is printed on newsstand paper. Is it really? It is a different stock. It feels like newsstand paper. It's not as yellow. It's a little bleached, but uh -huh. I was surprised to find it on that kind of stock, which, you know, maybe would explain the 399 price point, oh. but most books are 399 now. So go figure. Um, I want to make the people aware of this. Number one, it's great little package. Number two, there are facsimiles out there. This is a really good one. Um, the UPC and the DC logo, the modern DC logo are hidden on the back cover. No one get fooled by this on eBay, okay? See that 399 price point under the comics code? Mm -hmm. That's point. what to look out for. <clears throat> this is considered more of a prototype Sergeant Rock story as he's not officially named Sergeant Rock until the the Easy Company, Easy Co. series begins in issue 83. The character in this story is referred to as Sergeant Rocky. Okay. Now, it, it, but it says the Rock of Easy Company on the cover. That's his nickname. You know, they don't call him Sergeant Rock. It's not Sergeant Rock. If you read issue 83, Sergeant Rock, the character, is a very different character than Sergeant Rocky of Easy Co. Okay. So, you know, obviously they were still working things out. Um, although DC is kind of laying down the law here by saying, here's this facsimile of the first appearance of Sergeant Rock. Wait a second. Shouldn't you have done issue 83 instead? Oh, that's a good point. Not the first time they'd done this. They did this when they did the Millennium Editions in the year 2000. They reprinted this issue as the first Sergeant Rock. So that would be like, well, I guess Marvel did that. It would be like Marvel doing Wolverine or Incredible Hulk 1 or no, X-Men Annual 17 or 14, whatever it is, first Gambit, you know? <laughs> right. Uh, so the debate continues. I will say, if you're looking for the first appearance of Sergeant Rock, this is 
the original 81 is a ghost book. It's very hard to find. 83, however, still very undervalued in my opinion. I don't have one, so don't buy them yet. Don't drive them up, people. Wait till I'm done. I'm just surprised they didn't use print. You know the cost of setting up a a, a four color newsprint run. I, I it feels like newsprint paper. It's not glossy. It's matte. It's thinner. I was surprised to see it. Wow. Of course, I devoured it. I've never read yeah. it, so uh, very happy that that book came out. We did it, Richard. One entire episode without me saying Blackhawk. <laughs> yes, you did almost. Crap. <laughs> Thanks, everybody, uh, members. We'll see you Wednesday for the bonus episode, Thursday for the live stream. Everyone else, we will see you back here on Monday. Yep, good to be back. Everybody, stay safe.